So Psalm chapter 2, I'd like to read the text and then pray for us this morning, and then we'll dive in. Are you all ready? All right, Psalm 2 reads, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that He not become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Let's pray. Father, we come before You in this time as we're able to open Your Word and study it together, and we are grateful for the text before us. We're thankful that You have spoken to us through Your Word, and we pray now as we proclaim the Word of the Lord this day that You might strengthen me, Lord. May I be but a voice proclaiming the truths that You have given to us in Holy Scripture. May I decrease that You might increase. May our love for You, our love for the Son, may that increase even now as we study Your Word. May hearts be transformed and changed as we come to this text this morning. We pray this all for Your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I began to note this morning is, uh, of course, this week is a, a significant week. Many are calling this election before us uh, an election for the ages, the most important election in national history. And I would say this, that regardless of whether you agree with that statement or not, you have to admit that it's definitely one of the most unusual, isn't it? I mean, I, I was thinking about this day. We've, we've never had an election following eight months of uncertainty, uh, various periods of lockdown, protests, riots, and a pandemic. So if for no other reason, this election is pretty unique. And we come to this time in, in the year 2020 as Christians, and I think we begin to ask questions like this question, how should we understand the times? How should we think about and respond to a changing culture that we see around us? How will the events of 2020 that I just described and many others on a personal level, how will they impact God's purposes in this world? And therefore, how should they impact the way that we understand the world around us and, and how we live our lives for the glory of God? Because we don't just come here this morning so you can hear a sermon and, and go out these doors and say, well, that was nice and go on about our day and not be changed by it. We know that we come here to sit under God's Word because we want to be changed by it. We want God to be the one that determines how we live. And all these questions and thoughts came into my head as I considered this text this morning, and it drew me to this wonderful psalm that I read, a psalm that, that clearly marks out for us in a poetic form the great play of human history. You see that what we're facing today really isn't new at all, is it? Sure, it seems like our circumstances are pretty unusual. It seems like they're unique, but Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 says, there is nothing new under the sun. After all, since the, the fall that was chronicled in Genesis chapter 3, the world has seen a lot of evil in many changing times, has it not? From the moment of Adam's sinful rebellion in the garden against God's clear command, all creation in general and mankind in specific has been in dire straits and, and has looked forward to the day, the day for a promised deliverer. 
one whom would be sent by God. And step by step and piece by piece through the Scriptures, we saw that unfolding portrait of a Savior who would come. I mean, think with me. We won't turn there, but think through these texts. Maybe jot them down. Genesis 3.15, right after the, the point of the fall in the garden, there is a promise, a promise that a Savior, this Savior would be the chosen seed of the woman, the one that would crush the serpent's head. In Genesis 12, just a few chapters later, we learn that He would be the descendant of Abraham. He'd be the one through whom God would bless all the nations. In Genesis 49, verse 10, we learned that this this Lord, this Savior, would be from the tribe of Judah, and that the scepter would, would never depart from His hand until peace would come. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses says that He would be a prophet greater than Himself, And in 2 Samuel 7, we learn that He would be a son of David, a son of God, whose throne and kingdom would be established forever. Our text today in Psalm 2 carries on this unfolding pattern in history and portrait of the King, of the one that would be the chosen seed. And what we see here in an even brighter and clearer picture is the one who is God's King, the one who is God's Son. Now, just a a bit of detail behind this. The psalm does lack a title, and so some would say we're we're not sure who wrote it. Um, Acts chapter 4 verse 25 tells us that this psalm was written by King David himself. And it's noted to be a royal psalm. It's an enthronement psalm. It declares the the coronation of, of, of a Davidic king. What's interesting is, while it had a place in history, while it had a, a, a particular point and a particular son of David, either David himself or perhaps Solomon, we also see in this psalm that it also points forward. It points forward to one that was the long-expected Messiah, the King, the final David, the second Adam, the Christ, the Anointed One. The one that God would use to usher in a cosmic kingdom, a king who would never cease to reign or to rule. So, as we come to this psalm today, and you might ask, why this psalm? In a day of uncertainty, in a day where we see the raging of the nations, when the challenges and trials that we face are are not truly as unique as we thought. We must understand from this psalm in God's Word that there is hope. There is hope that God's plan for mankind continues on despite man's rebellion, despite what we see around us. And here in Psalm 2, what what I'd like to show and reveal and point out today is these these prophetic movements, four of them that we see in the text. It's wonderful when, when God, through His wonderful providence and inspiration of the Word of God, lays it out in such a clean manner for us, right? And this one we see four clear movements that, that describe the mutiny of mankind and at the same time the majesty of Christ, our King. And my desire for you guys today that this should provide a deep comfort, a deep comfort and an abiding confidence that God's plan has not changed. God's plan was established here in the Old Testament. It was written by David a thousand years before Christ came. There is no plan B, just plan A, and God continues. So, I hope that this reminder that Christ is king over the nations would would give us comfort, would give us encouragement, would give us confidence to continue to proclaim Him and live for Him. So, if you don't mind, let's, let's look at the text. Let's dive in, and I want to show us, first of all, the first scene in verses 1 through 3, and I'll I'll entitle it for those that are taking notes, the rebellion of the nations. And I hope to show this is a foolish revolt. The scene, the text begins, our first word in the text is, why? It begins with a question. The question is only asked once in this text, but it's amazing. It dominates the first three verses. We may not see why over and over again, but if you read the text, you could read it this way. Why are the nations in an uproar? 
Why are the peoples devising a vain thing? Why are the kings of the earth taking their stand? Why are the rulers taking counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed? Why? It's a rhetorical question. If you're looking for an answer, you're not going to see it. It's rhetorical because the audacity of this rebellion against God and His anointed one is so clear that an answer is not necessary. One commentator said this, this is not so much a request for information as an exclamation of astonishment that these mere mortals should set themselves up against the one chosen by God. And what the psalmist does here is he gives us a list of four groups, doesn't he? Did you catch those? They're they're listed in parallels that represent this mutinous mankind. He says the nations and the peoples, and those are them that are led by the kings and the rulers. These are the ones who make up this rebellion. And the reason why the psalmist gives us these four groups is to emphasize the totality of mankind. What we see here is the reality, it's the extent of of the depravity of this rebellion. It's individually and collectively a rejection and a rebellion and a revolt against God. And in this we see an expression of of a, a doctrine that's vital. It's the doctrine of human depravity. It's the doctrine that says that people are, as a result of the fall, not inclined or even able to love God wholly with heart, mind, and strength but rather inclined by their sinful nature to serve their own will and their own desires and to reject the rule of Almighty God. That's the depravity that we see here. It's what we read of in Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, which says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand who seek after God, but they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. It's the same thing that Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 when he says that both Jews and Greeks are under sin, and he adds in verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless, There's none that have done good, not even one. He echoes this in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It reflects what we know of Jeremiah 17, verse 9, which says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately sick. You see, man's not basically good as our culture would like us to believe. Man's dead in his sins and his trespasses. Man rejects God. There's no fear of God before the eyes of unregenerate man. And Psalm 2 points to this depravity, and it tells, if we go back to the text, it shows this depravity in action. Look what they do. Look at the character of the rebellion expressed in four verbs here. First, the nations are in an uproar. The nations rage. The verb here literally speaks of of a restless mob, a tumultuous event. This parallels what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 12, that the nations are like a roaring, foaming sea. And the use of a perfect verb here, that that particular tense, notes the reality that this has been and always is the state of the nations from the point of the fall. It's not new. They're continually in an uproar. And I'd just like to add this as a quick application. I think sometimes we wrongly think that things on earth are worse today than they were in the past. We look around, we see our depraved culture, and we go, uh, it's a culture that embraces all manner of sin and wickedness. Maybe we think back to our childhood days when it wasn't like that, and, and, and we, we, we think, yep, they're, they're definitely worse than they've ever been. Let me just bring to your memory a few texts of Scripture. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. 
The Lord looked down, Yahweh looked down on the earth and saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now consider that wickedness. And we know what God does as a result of that wickedness. He brings the flood and he wipes out the entirety of mankind save Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And there's other texts I could go to. We could go on and on speaking of the wickedness of the nations found in in, in Scripture. I could point to texts that talk about nations that sacrifice their own children on the altar to their gods, Israel even doing that. We could talk about the brutality of the Assyrians or the Babylonians and all the, the horrible things that those empires would do to their enemies. We could talk about the sexual immorality, the rampant immorality of the Greco Roman world. Our world mirrors that much more than we understand. We could talk about the gross idolatry of the nations across all of the ages. We could trace that line of human history from the garden all the way to today, and we would find this continual thread of rebellion against God. We live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world where unregenerate mankind, their heart as John Calvin said, is an idol factory, continually producing new idols to worship. The nations continue to rage and roar and rebel and revolt against God and His sovereignty. It's not new. So don't be surprised. But they don't just rage, do they? Look back to our text. They're also devising a vain thing. This word could be translated, they plot in vain. The verb here speaks of the fact that this is a rebellion that's in progress. It's underway. It's even now going on. They're devising, they're speaking, they're plotting, they're planning. It's, it's what Psalm 38, 12 says, that those who seek my life lay snares for me, and those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction, and they devise treachery all day long. Same verb. This is an active, treacherous plot of the people against God. But but notice, the plot is a vain thing. The vanity of this plot is that it will fail. The vanity of this plot is the reality. The irony is that all of man's scheming, all of man's greatest plans and ultimate conspiracies against God are ultimately empty and fruitless. little man sits on earth and shakes his fist up at God. He devises his plots. He plans his treacherous ways and strategizes against the one who made him. So, the psalmist continues to talk, our third verb. We see not only are the nations in an uproar, not only do the peoples devise a a vain thing. Look at this. The kings take their stand and the rulers take counsel together. Literally here, the verb means they set themselves against. This speaks of of the resistance of this rebellion. It's, It's interesting as well that this is the same kind of word that's used elsewhere to talk about preparation for battle. This is a word we see in 1 Samuel 17, 16, where it's used to talk of of a big guy, Goliath. It says in that text that Goliath took his stand against all of Israel and did what? Defied the armies of the living God. To say that they take their stand is this. They stand against everything that their Creator God stands for. And they stand up against Him. This is what the rulers and kings do. They they take their stand in opposition of God. They conspire together on how they might be free of Him. And notice, they, they do this deliberately. This is a concerted effort. They come together. And I don't know, but it's hard to get two nations in our, in our world today to come together on pretty much anything. But this text makes it clear that all the nations come together in conspiring a vain thing, in plotting against God. All their scheming, all their devising, all their plotting, this concerted effort, look at our text, it's against who? 
the Lord and against His anointed. This is the absurdity of this statement. It's against the one that created them. Mankind comes together in in alliance against their creator and their king. They, They refuse to acknowledge him. They refuse to submit to him as their sovereign creator. And then notice what it says at the end in verse 3. Here's the content. Here's what they say. They say, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Fetters here, if you're not familiar with that word, it's an old word. Fetters and cords. It speaks of bonds. It speaks of shackles. It speaks of those things that would would hold a prisoner together. You see, this is the the speech of of the rebellious nations. They turn and they say, let us come together and let us break free of these bonds that God has put upon us. Oh, the folly of rebellious mankind. Oh, the folly. They see God's dominion and His reign as nothing but oppression. They want to be free. They want to rid themselves of all manner of restraint. They want to be free to commit all manner of sin and abominations. Ultimately, they want to be free to be their own God. That's the point. They don't want to be accountable to anyone but themselves. They see God's bonds as restrictive rather than loving. The the prince of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said this on this matter, and I, I just love this. He says, quote, to a graceless neck, the yoke of Christ is intolerable, but to the saved sinner, it is easy and light. Hear that again. To the graceless neck, the yoke of Christ is intolerable, but to the saved sinner, it is easy and light. I don't know about you, but in my own life, that is the truth. The law of God before I came to know Christ and a saving manner was something that was a burden. And then by the work of God's Spirit to regenerate me, it no longer was a burden. It was a joyful thing, not restrictive, but actually freeing to know that I could walk in a manner that pleased the one who created me. It's a beautiful thing. But see, the unregenerate here, they seek to cast off any law of God. They, they see God as a tyrant, but to us that are saved, He's a treasure. And the ultimate progress of rebellion, let me say this as an aside because I think it's important to note. While there's nothing new under the sun, while what we see of wickedness and evil before us in our day is, has existed all the way back from the garden, from the point of rebellion against God, We need to recognize that there is a progression in rebellion, and we see that in a manner as we look around us and see those that call themselves atheists. We read it. Psalm 14.1 says, the fool, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The word for fool there literally means insane. It's insanity. And we know this. Turn quickly with me, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We know this in Romans. In Romans chapter 1, Paul gives us an illustration that I think really gives us a picture of our day. Starting in verse 18, I want to read this text to us. He says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they're without excuse. Let's stop for a second. He says very clearly, Paul says, they see the created order, they see what's around them, and there is enough there to know that there is a Creator. Not enough to save, but enough to condemn. He goes on professing, or verse 21 I am, for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 
professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You might say, well, we don't do that. We don't have any idols of cows and birds at our home. Let's read on. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and, all they, and although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. Is that not America 2020? Evolution has accepted in our culture as truth. Why? To replace the Creator with something else. The creature. The family, which God designed very specifically from the garden for a very particular purpose. To be a picture, as Ephesians 5, between a husband and a wife, to be a picture of Christ's love for the church. That the family unit would, would be this unit by which children are taught to know God, to love God, to obey God. It's been, it's been replaced. The family unit's been removed. The revolution has come to the place that homosexuality is accepted and that we've even come to a place of sanity, insanity, not sanity, a place of insanity that you can be born a boy but really be a girl. That your DNA, what God has created and formed in you, that you can, you can change that. You can alter who you are. This is why we see lawlessness and wickedness. It's what Psalm 2 tells us. What do they want to do? They want to burst their bonds apart. They want to free themselves from God. They don't want to live a life of restraint and obedience to Him. They want to make their rules. They want to be their God. This is the rebellion of the nations. Look back at our text. We see the response of God. What does God say? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, and then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I love this transition in the text. The nations have the first three verses to proclaim their rebellion against God, and God says, enough. And notice, what's it say? He's not threatened. He's not threatened by their empty words. God sits. God doesn't, doesn't jump up in fear and panic. Oh, no, what do I do? The nations are rebelling against me. He doesn't jump to His feet in, in fear of their threats. He doesn't prepare His armies to wage war against them. He sits. And sitting upon His throne in the heavens, He looks down, He looks upon the malice and the power and all the plots and the schemes of man, and He laughs. This may be the first time you've actually read in the Scriptures that God laughs. And this is not a ha-ha laugh. This is a laugh of just what the text says, a laugh of derision. He doesn't see their rebellion as a joke. 
He sees their rebellion as absurd. He mocks them. He taunts them. He ridicules them for their folly because that's exactly what it is. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. These foolish, rebellious nations, this uproar, this vain attempt to stand against God and His anointed, it's vanity. God laughs. And this is really what we see over and over again in human history, isn't it? I I thought of an illustration that I think is a, a good one. Think of this. Remember Pharaoh at the time of Moses? Pharaoh wanted to get rid of, you know, there was uh, the, the Israelite nation, the Hebrews, before the Israelite nation, the Hebrews were increasing in number, and so Pharaoh has, I got an idea, I'm going to kill all of the male babies. But instead, instead of getting rid of all the Hebrews, look what happens. At the same time, his own daughter, a princess, a princess in his own court gives a princely education to Moses, the one who ultimately becomes the deliverer of the nation. God laughs. I think of Acts chapter 12 where Herod Agrippa I, there's that text we read that he, he begins his violent attack against the church. He kills James. It's the first, the first apostle that's martyred. He kills James, the brother of John, and he's seeking to kill Peter. He locks him up in prison. And God comes at night and opens a prison door and leads Peter out. Peter's safe and free, and the text following it, we learn that Herod goes to another place and proclaims how great he is, and God kills him by being eaten by worms. God laughs. And I love the text that follows, Acts 12, 24, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. You see, we see this over and over and over and over again since the, since the beginning of time. The efforts of mankind to blot out God's redemptive work only builds up the church. The the work of mankind, what they see to, to produce suffering only spreads the faith. The things that are designed for persecution really only serves to propel the gospel forward. And so I just say this to you and I, we have no need to be filled with anxiety or fear when we look around and it appears like the world around us, that its wickedness is growing and the world is winning the battle. There is no need of fear because our God sits in the heavens. He scoffs at them. He laughs. And I'd say this, my wife said it and I think it's true. He who sits in heaven, he gets the last laugh. And look at our text, a couple things to point out. He doesn't just sit and laugh, he speaks to them, doesn't he? He responds. The word then is there. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. I love this. uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 says, don't count God's mercy and patience as slowness. Sometimes we look around and we see God's not acting as fast as I think he should. So he's slow. No, he's patient. And aren't you glad he's patient? There's some of you in this room that if he wasn't patient, if he had come back 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you wouldn't know Christ. You'd be left in your sins and your trespasses. Aren't you glad that God is a patient God? But even God's patience has an end, doesn't it? A point where he responds and he speaks to them in anger. He speaks to them with fury. He terrifies them. It's a text in Hebrews chapter 10, one of the most famous sermons ever given in the continental U.S. was given by Jonathan Edwards, and he preached on Hebrews 10, 31, and that text says this, what a fearful, what a terrifying thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. When we read this text and recognize that the one who created the universe by speaking it into existence is the same one who now turns his burning speech onto the rebellious nations, the one who is the consuming fire, turns his attention to them. And what's it do? It terrifies them, as it should, as it should. But look at his powerful pronouncement. Look at verse 6, but as for me… I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I love this. There's an emphasis here. But as for me, I have done this. 
It's, it's as though, as I said, God looks down, he looks at the puny challenges in verse 3, he looks at the nations that have assembled themselves together, and he says, whoa, 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 I've already acted. There's nothing you can do. I've installed my king. Here God speaks uh, what's such a beautiful promise, the promise we alluded to earlier of 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Davidic kingdom, right? The Davidic promise, the hope of that covenant. And He says there that I will raise up to David, He says, I'll raise up your seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish His kingdom. Then He says, I will establish the throne of His kingdom forever, and I'll be a father to Him, and He will be a son to me, and your house and your kingdom shall endure forever and ever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. It's as if God says, the nations can rage and scream and plot and plan, but God's plan continues forward. Amen? Do you understand this? Do you believe this? You know, it's really easy for us to even come into a church to hear the truths of God's Word and walk out as practical atheists, that that affirm truths with our minds, even with our lips, but don't demonstrate that by our lives. God's sovereign. God's in charge. God's got a response for the people, not only in Psalm 2, but today. And so this should bring us incredible encouragement to know that God is the one, Daniel 2 tells us, He is the one that removes kings and establishes kings. He is the one that that, that turns the path of the way, as the proverb says, of the heart of the king. So we should have great hope. We should have great boldness and confidence, knowing that even in this time, even even ahead of of an election like this one, with all of the worries and concerns that can flood into our hearts and our minds, let's just remember this truth. God is on His throne. Remember this truth that what effect can man have on God's plan or program? I mean, really think about it. Our text is telling us really clearly here, right? God's current plan is this, to bring many sons to glory. God is now building His church on the earth. He is saving uh, people from every tribe and tongue and nation, right? He is saving this people, redeeming them through salvation, building His church, and it says that the gates of Hades cannot prevail against that work. Christ is doing that. And there is a coming day where there is going to be an earthly reign and rule of Christ, when Christ will return and He will set up His throne on Mount Zion. His feet will land upon, uh, upon the mountain and it will split. And that King, when He comes, He will reign. And it says in Psalm 110 that he will, His enemies will be made a footstool for His feet. God's sovereign plan marches on it marches on in human history. It's at no more threat today than it's ever been. There is no threat against God. Mankind continues to do what they've done since the garden. The ages of sin and transgression, the, the horrible mutiny that we read of in verses 1 through 3 continues, and God says, yet I have set my king upon my holy mountain. We see the rebellion of the nations. We've seen the response of God Look thirdly, the the third scene is the rule of the sun. I just alluded to it. It says in our text, I'll I'll surely tell the decree of the Lord. And He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthenware. I love this. Here we see the king's enthronement speech. It's it's now the son who speaks. The nations have spoken, God has spoken, and now the son speaks. And the son's revealed here to the nations. Look at it, right? It's in Psalm 2 that Yahweh moves from the lesser David, the one that was son of Jesse, to the greater David, to Jesus Christ, to the, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God to come. And I love it. We hear, uh, hear one of the, the first mentions or one of the, 
most poignant mentions of the fact of Yahweh's declaration of a father-son relationship. And you might ask, how does this speak of Jesus, right? This was written a thousand years before Him. Well, let's turn to the New Testament. I want to show you a few places that would help you. Uh, Quickly to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, because in the New Testament we see that the significance that multiple times there's instances in which this psalm is quoted or alluded to that are really helpful for understanding. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, and we'll quickly hit these. In Matthew 3, we know this is this is an important point, Matthew 3, verse 17. This is the scene of Jesus' baptism. And at this baptism, as you know, it says in verse 17, after being baptized by John, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting upon Him, and behold, a voice out of heaven, and it said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. If you turn forward to Matthew 17, just a few pages further, we see a similar thing, this time at the transfiguration. At the point in time when, when Jesus' when, when, when Jesus flesh is, is peeled back, as it were, just for an instant, so that those three disciples, Peter, James, and John, might have uh, even a glimpse of the glory of Christ, the glory that He had with His Father. We read in verse 5, while He was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. If you turn ahead into Acts chapter 13, we see another connection there. Acts chapter 13, verse 33. That text is beautiful here. Here, Luke, the author of Acts, connects this psalm with Christ's resurrection. He says here, he says, Christ's resurrection was declared as the evidence of His divine sonship. Look at what it says, and we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that He raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It's the same thing that Paul affirms in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, when he writes, concerning his son who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. And lastly, in Acts chapter 4, we find this wonderful text. I alluded to it, verse 25, but 24 through 28, it's this wonderful time where the disciples, John and Peter, have been commanded by the chief priests and the elders and the rulers not to preach Christ. Stop talking about Him. And what happens? When they heard this, they lifted their voice. They come back, they're, they're talking to the, the believers that are gathered, and they lifted their voice to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is You who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, Your servant, said, Why do the Gentiles rage? And the peoples devise futile things. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers are gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. Now listen to this. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. He makes the connection there. The connection that's made is that in Psalm 2, when it talks about who the nations would would come against, who the nations would stand up and take their stand against. It was against Yahweh and His King. And it tells us who that King is, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And lest we miss this, I love verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Again, more hope is found here. Hope that Jesus Christ is the Son, He is the King of Psalm 2. He is the literal historical Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. He's the Messiah that was to come. He's the Messiah who has come. He is the Messiah who will come again. Did you hear it? Your holy servant Jesus, the one that was anointed to do whatever God's hand and purpose predestined to occur. Who's in control? God is. Who reigns? Who rules? Christ is King. Sure, we see the world around us going in directions that we would rather not see the world around us go. 
but we can trust that God is in control and continues to lead. And we see that back in our text in Psalm 2 because He promises to this king an inheritance, doesn't He? He says in verse 8, Ask of me and I'll surely give the nations as your inheritance. The very ends of the earth is your possession. What a blessed truth that Christ, Christ has been given, as it says in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to Christ, both in heaven and on earth. What a blessed hope to know what we learned over the last two weeks from Colossians 1, 15 to 20, that Jesus Christ is preeminent, that He is supreme over all creation, and He is supreme over redemption. And now we're learning as well that He is supreme over the nations. And there is a day coming, there is a day coming when all nations and all peoples will be given to Him as His inheritance. That's what we read in the book of Revelation. We read of people from every nation coming before the throne and dwelling with God for eternity. Verse 9 tells us that He doesn't just get the inheritance, He also has the right to rule. Look at it. You shall break them with a rod of iron and shatter them like earthenware. The Son of God receives the power of God. He's able to break them, to shatter them. The, the word here for earthenware is potter's clay. And if you go to Israel or any part of the ancient Near East, one of the artifacts that is in great abundance is broken pottery. Pottery is not strong. It's fragile. What this text says is Christ has such power, He can break them like a piece of pottery. All of the nation's vanity, all of their military might, all of their, all of their standing against God is like potter's clay. And you notice he has a rod of iron. The word rod there can also be translated in the Old Testament as a staff or a scepter. And I think it's a beautiful thing, this rod of iron, this staff, this scepter here, it speaks to the fact that, that God's king is also the good shepherd the same one that will dash to pieces those who rebel against Him is the one that uses that staff to guide and lead those who love and trust and believe in Him. There's one more scene, and that's our fourth scene, the repentance of the wise. The repentance of the wise. Look at what it says, Now therefore, O king, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence, rejoice with trembling, do homage to the Son, that He not become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. If you read verses 1 through 9 and, and were to stop, the expectation of verse 10 may be different from what we read. As I was thinking about this, right, we've read all of this up to this point of, of God and His ability to stand against the nations, of the vanity of what, they, what they've done, of the fact in verse 9 that He would break them with a rod of iron, and maybe you expect that next is, is going to be, and so He does. He breaks them. But that's not what we read. The expectation of immediate judgment of this powerful king to smash them, instead what we find is an opportunity for Repentance. Anybody says the God of the Old Testament is a God of, of wrath and law, and the God of the New Testament is a God of love and redemption? Well, here's a text that I would argue. What do we see here? Repentance, redemption, an opportunity for them, for the, for the kings, the rulers, the nations. He calls out to them, those who, have, who are devising a vain thing, and he says, rather than taking your stand, here's an opportunity. And he does it by, by some clear commands. He says, show discernment. That's an imperative there. Show discernment. Take warning. He, he does what we read in the Proverbs over and over again. When wisdom speaks of the fact, it says in chapter 8 of Proverbs, O sons, listen to me, for blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction. Be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me. The plea of the psalmist here is that they wouldn't be foolish, that they would repent of their rebellion, and instead that they would turn to the one who is their king. They would submit to him. They would love him. And it tells us exactly what he calls them to do. Look at verse 11. Worship. Worship the Lord with reverence. Rejoice with trembling. 
I don't have time to go into all the detail of this, but think about this. I think sometimes we come to even this place, and we can come to the things of God and the things of, of Christ, and we can come to it in a flippant manner. Our worship isn't reverent. We come and we rejoice, but we don't do it with trembling. It seems like a strange statement, doesn't it? Rejoice with trembling. Worship with fear. But we've got to remember the amazing reality that we worship an almighty, holy God. He is not like us. He is transcendent. He is beyond us, and our worship must be exalted worship. Don't bring God down to your level. Praise Him as He sits in the heavenlies. Worship Him as the glorious King of kings. Again, Charles Haddon Spurgeon says this. He says, there must ever be a holy fear mixed with the Christian's joy. This is a sacred compound yielding a sweet smell. And we must see that we never, we burn no other upon the altar. Fear with joy is torment, and joy without holy fear would be presumption. We need both because we see this God who is almighty, who calls us to Himself and pleads with us to repent, that calls us to repentance. And He tells us lastly to do what? To kiss the Son. That's literally what the text says kiss the sun. The, the Nazb be translated as do homage to the sun because it's, it, that's the main point. It speaks of allegiance. It speaks of submission here. It speaks of an act of, of homage, just like a, uh, one that would come before the Queen of England would bow before her and pay homage. The nations are to serve God, to acknowledge their, the King, the one who Yahweh has set up upon His throne, the one who reigns over all the nations. And why? Because it says in our text, why should the nations humbly repent? Why should the nations turn from their mutiny? Lest He become angry and you perish in the way. Lest His wrath be kindled. We've talked about this before, and I think it's a wonderful truth that Jesus Christ is our Savior, but I think it's just as wonderful a truth that Jesus Christ is the judge that He is the one that will judge the living and the dead. Revelation 19 reads, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following Him on white horses. And from His mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it He may strike down the nations and rule them with a rod of iron, and tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on His robe and on His thigh is the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords." That is Jesus Christ. That is our King. And I'll close with this. Look back to our text in verse 12. There's a choice, and it's articulated there. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. See, here's the choice. You may not see it in the text, but it's there. Will you choose wrath or refuge? There's no refuge from Him, only refuge in Him. Those who love and worship God and His Son and His King, those who see Jesus Christ, we see His dominion as a place of rest, a place of refuge. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in Christ. John 3.36 says it this way, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This is the pinnacle for all of us that are in this room. 
the question that every single individual on this earth must answer. Every single one of us has to answer, what do you do with my son? Salvation or damnation depends upon our relationship to Christ, to the Son, the Lord of creation, the one supreme in redemption. What do you do with my Son? We either bow with Him, bow before Him in humble adoration and take refuge in Him, or we stand with the nations in verses 1 through 3 and wobble our measly fist in the face of God and rebel against Him. Now, these truths should comfort us and give us confidence for the days ahead. And I know it might seem like a, a hard text, and you might come back from this and, and go, okay, I need to think about this. But as this week moves on and as votes are cast and counted, as our culture continues to, to go in a direction and a path that it's going to go in, come back to Psalm 2, not to escape from our culture, not to run away, not to put our head in the sand and pretend that, you know, it doesn't include us. God's left us here. He's left us here to be a witness to this culture. He's left us here to point those who put their fist up against God, to point them to the Son, to point them to the One who is King of kings and Lord of lords, that they might find refuge in Him rather than His wrath. Amen? Be encouraged, be strengthened, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Our Lord is with us. Let's pray. We thank You, God, for the truths of Your Word. We thank You, Christ, that You are King. We thank You that all are blessed who take refuge in You. It is my prayer, Lord, that we might all in this room, that we might take refuge in You as our Savior and our Redeemer. Protect us, Lord. Strengthen us for the days ahead. Give us confidence to proclaim the truths of Your Word and the glorious gospel so that many might come to find refuge in you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.